plug in your cassette player. It's time for Rec Play, the real creator talk show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Rec Play. My name is Patrick. Today, we have a very, very interesting topic to talk about, and it's involving the future of events. This is a big topic as uh, events keep on evolving, but at the same time, they're not going very, very far these days. So we wanted to start talking about it and pretty much speculating what events will look like uh, in the near future once we get the chance to coming together. Uh, joining me today, uh, we have uh, Stuart Reynolds, who's also known as Brittle Star on the internet. And we also have uh, Amara, Amara in Seattle, as her name says, she is from Seattle and she's also part of the Seattle YouTube community. And uh, both uh, my guests today, they're also in the event planning business as um, uh, they do events. Uh, well, I mean, Stuart had an event uh, very recently and uh, Amara, Amara also plans events with her team. But I will let um, each, each one of you talk about that a little bit, introduce yourself and talk about the events that you you were planning and to how things you know had to change and adapt to today's uh circumstances i'll let you start amara so um i'm amara Dumlau, also known as amara in seattle and i'm on the board of the seattle youtube community um we have an event that we've thrown a couple of times called seattle youtube day we also have kind of an ongoing series of meetups and uh, things of that nature. And to be honest, while it's a Seattle-based uh, YouTube community and it's YouTube, TikTok, there's a lot of fluxing in creator spaces as I think we all find happens more and more. Um, but we are um, kind of fluxing towards a situation where we're doing more things digitally. We've had a couple of meetups that have happened that way to discuss things like thumbnail optimization and what we want to see happen in the future. So this is something that's near and dear to the heart of my uh, my like social media based community. And um, I'm really excited to talk about that today. And awesome. uh, as Patrick mentioned, my name is Stuart Reynolds and better known as Brittle Star Online. Since 2013, I've been creating video content on social media as a full time job and uh, with myself and my family. And uh, this past year, uh, after having gone to VidCon and Playlist Live in the US <clears throat> and Bufferfest in Toronto uh, and WebFest in Vancouver, I decided that uh, it'd be really fun to have an event that was similar to a VidCon or a Playlist, uh, but in Canada uh, with a bit of a Canadian focus. And uh, so that was Social Media North. And we planned it for about a year and then uh, the COVID hit. And uh, so that we ended up doing uh, the event online, just reducing it down to the business day panels alone and doing that all online through Zoom. Um, and it was fairly successful, certainly not the event that we planned, but, um, but that's, that's what we did this year and it was, it was fun. Definitely a return of events, no pun intended, but def like you had, like you said, you, in one year you were planning this because I, I keep seeing the ads appearing, social media is coming. It was very exciting. I mean, you know, talking about having having a huge event like this in Canada, which we don't really have. Buffalo Festival was the closest thing that we came to, and uh, I mean, you had to make like, you you and your team had to make drastic changes, like very very last minute, to adapting to this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you know when we were doing the planning for the in person event for the year prior, uh, there was a team of about sort of like a core team of about three or four people, and then there was a larger team, maybe up to about eleven people. And um, it was just going to be a first year event. So we didn't expect things to be too massive and uh, fairly manageable, but it was still a big undertaking. Uh, and then, of course, when we had to uh, postpone it uh, initially uh, in the beginning of March, middle of March, um, we then after about a month decided, well, we should maybe do this online inst instead because we'd like to, I think there's some value in what we're offering as far as the panels go uh, to content creators in Canada. and. So we, we did that, but that just meant that it was reduced down to me and my wife doing it. This <laughs> is sort of everyone who was involved in the in-person event was kind of like, well, we don't have anything for you to do. And this is just a lot of keystrokes, a lot of key tapping. And I think that that's not necessarily to say that online events uh, can just be done easily with one person. Uh, but I think because we were trying to craft something that we didn't really know what we were doing and trying to learn as fast as we could, uh, it just meant that a lot of that responsibility fell to me and trying just to navigate how to do it best uh, and just right from the technology to uh, how to promote it and market it and make it sound interesting and seem interesting. 
Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, you also like at some point postponed it first to potentially having the opening, but this and then again, uh, you change your mind to having it in May, as I think it was mm -hmm. predicted uh, originally, and then do it online. I myself, uh, I would say, like you know, those who know me, I you know, we've been planning events for the past couple of years now, and uh, I mean, we we were lucky. Honestly, we were lucky that we had our last in-person event right before COVID hit us. Um, which was a fantastic event. And then uh, we had plans. We had plans already to do um, a massive event. It was, it was a two-day event, uh, a creator camp uh, up north here in Quebec to, uh, you know, welcoming people in, doing different kind of activities, just, you know, networking and so on. And in a way, thankfully, we'd never announced it because even if we, because it was postponed, we postponed it from May to August. And as things were going, we had to cancel it and we never even announced it. Uh, and like everyone else, we had to pivot to doing stuff online, uh, which in a way, you know, like it's manageable. You can work, you can still create some sort of experience, but it's never the same as doing the you know, in-person experience. So, um, yeah, we, we can't help, we can't wait for uh, reopenings and stuff. And that's why today we're ta actually talking about that. We're talking about what can we expect when we, when we talk about opening, like once, once things open and we can come together, like we, we've already seen, you know, whether it's restaurants, bars, uh, any other public places that I have open right now, we know like they're taking safety measures and so on. Um, what would what would what would the events look like? So if if maybe one of you want to start speculating or thinking about it. I've actually thought a great deal about this. A lot of my social media space is about traveling to events. That's a lot of what I've done. Um, so we were talking like VidCon. I went to Social Media Marketing World right before this whole thing, uh, you know, kind of took place. And I think th on the basic levels, there's going to be a lot more thought about like hygiene and safety, I think, across the board with events. Um, you know, I think that sometimes I've noticed at certain events, there'll be like hand sanitizer stations. I just see that being like super prevalent all the time. People thinking a little bit more hopefully about like their convention experience or their event experience. So taking breaks. I hope that um, event organizers are building more breaks into spaces because I think it's gonna be a real adjustment for people coming back out of their houses and back into really social situations. Um, I also attended a, an American Marketing Association Los Angeles um, kind of like virtual event and they were talking about events and they kept talking about how people are really used to being able to now, now that we've d done a lot of like virtual events, people are used to being able to like hop on their phone in the middle of things. So there's going to be a lot of dual screen participation in the future that that's something we should kind of anticipate. And those of us who do this stuff now and who have always had digital components, I think we're going to be challenged to find situations where we can creatively use dual screen and and accept it as part of the norm now, you know, which I think in like social media spaces we've thought about for a long time. But yeah, I think the um, the the appeal of you know conventions and events and stuff, of course, is actually being in the same room as people, and that's always been kind of the big appeal to me uh, for going to places like Playlist or or, or VidCon, where especially playlist, I think, is that I can be in the same room and look around and go, oh, uh, you know, I'm in the same room as this person. I can go talk to this person and they can maybe connect me to somebody else. You'd kind of lose a little bit of that in the uh, online version of an event. But at the same time, the trade off is that we found uh, we were able to include panelists who there was no possible way they were going to be able to afford to get to come to the event itself um, and attendees in general. So there's like there's some trade offs there for sure. As Amara said, like, I think that when we get back to real life, um, I think in-person events are going to have to deal with, uh, you know, making sure people have, uh, you know, hand sanitizer and places like that'll be much more prevalent and the top of mind for a lot of people. Uh, thinking back in March, we were at Playlist in Orlando. I mean, that is an event that's built on young people hugging each other and breathing all over each other and clinging to each other and pictures and all that kind of stuff. And it's super fun. But I think now there'd probably be a lot of people who'd be like, ah, maybe like, I think a lot of older people, creators, and certainly myself would be like, I think maybe I'll just step back a little bit, just for a little bit. You know, I don't know how I can protect myself walking through the sea of 400 kids, that type of thing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it does change things. Uh, you talked about like, you know, on the, the whole online aspect, the whole digital aspect, 
I mean, doing stuff online right now has definitely opened doors to reaching out to people from all around the world. And I think by it, it kind of forced us to do it right, like to actually implement it, something that we, we may have not taught before. Uh, possibly even if we do in-person events, you know, integrating the online component this time uh, and, and opening doors to people who want to, you know, sit at home. Because again, even, even if they're, even if let's say we're doing an event in Seattle, for example, um, people might be like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to leave my home. You know, I don't feel safe. So I'd rather be behind the screen and still attend it, you know? So maybe like different price of tickets or something, you know, for people who are staying home um def health and safety you know as an organizer has always been number one for both mm -hmm. you know the staff and and the attendees so that, that you know that um we can't we can't like forget like we cannot miss that and maybe maybe even like you know like right now as you know masks are becoming much more prevalent wearing masks you know at, at events mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's gonna look different but i mean you know like i've, I've already seen like what's like uh, was it like a wedding like wedding pictures being done with masks. So, and that's an event. Uh, what I've seen actually in Montreal, I don't know, I don't know if you're in your corner, you've seen that. Um, there are companies who are renting out their parking spaces and they're um, bring they're line cars to come and you can rent a big screen, kind of like a drive-in theater and watch and watch the show or watch the panel on the screen. And some of the, some, some people here are, are using actually drive-in theaters to do interactive games and stuff where um, people like the panelists are attending it from home, but people are going bring their cars there and using an app to interact. Um, there have been a lot of that. Uh, I've, I've seen a lot of that, you know, where uh, cars are becoming part of the event, which wasn't a thing. It wasn't in, 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 in Europe. I think we saw um, a concert happening. Everyone had, yeah. their, everyone was in their cars. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a company that's in, in the UK that is now doing a uh, drive-in concert for comedy and music all over the UK, just sort of going to different drive-in movie theaters and doing that. I think that's great for that kind of thing. I think it doesn't necessarily translate over to the event aspect uh, because again, you kind of want to be in the same room. But I think as, you know, to your point, Patrick, I think that what it's, this has sort of forced people who are doing events to do is that it's kind of like a forced opportunity is what I've been calling it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's this notion of, well, we got to do something. We keep, we've got nothing to lose. So let's try this instead. And we wouldn't necessarily have said, let's try a, an online panel because everyone would be like, "Ugh, online panels. Who cares? I don't want to do that." But then you realize that it, it goes back to that true tenet of uh, the power of a good event is if you get the right people in that room. In that, you know, it doesn't matter if the room's real or virtual. If you get the right people in that room, the conversation is what becomes super valuable. And mm -hmm. I think that translates. And I think that you'll see sort of a hybrid of these events. Certainly for us for next year, um, we're looking at doing a little bit of if everything goes well. <laughs> not good and what was it today the bubonic plague they found again yeah so we'll see what happens next year um but i think that uh you know we'll we'll do a little mixture of uh in-person stuff but also have some online components for those people who can't get there plus it's just as valuable people in the chat are saying that uh they still don't feel ready going to a physical space to attending an event many people are attending like stuff like comedy uh comedy festivals and so on online um what like things are opening now right so what are if we can maybe even speculate because first i don't know like here in canada at least we had no news whatsoever whenever it comes to events they talked about gatherings but it was very like there was no, there wasn't like a very strict like like a very uh direct uh, information of saying like when can we all have events and stuff so we haven't been doing any events um for very very obvious reasons but like things like bars have opened uh, at least here in Montreal, uh, malls and so on, um, you know, and we always hear cases here, cases there. Um, when can we speculate? Do, do we like? Are we gonna wait for a vaccine, or is is it? Are they gonna let us have an event before that? Like, what are what are some like predictions like you guys could think of? I've got in regards to predictions, I've got no idea. It's like one wave, two waves, three waves. 
Um, in fact, I, as an event professional, probably like you all, I'm trying to figure out what the next reasonable place for me to plan to go to an event may be. Um, so one of the, we talked about, you talked a bit, Stuart, about VidCon. I was hoping to get to the chance to go to VidCon Mexico this year. I really thought it would be fun to attend, um, you know, an event. And they've said that they're going to have it in, I want to say, November, September, November. And now I'm like, I don't know if that's a time where I'm yet ready to be traveling, right? So um, I think the question is going to come down to, there's that cost piece too, right? Because a lot of people are probably not going to be comfortable traveling even when they can or going to events when they can. I think there's a good chance that um, it'll be less expensive for people who do feel comfortable going. Because just like you all, I have we have vague, as you all know, vague guidelines that are kind of coming out from like different sources about what is right to do. And then there's, you know, like your own personal take on what is right to do. Um, I don't know, but I am hoping to be collecting masks at events as part of their like swag packages. That's something for sure. Absolutely, I think that, uh... I think that things won't change dramatically. It won't go back to normal ever, uh, meaning they'll, they'll, we'll now go back to events who are uh, these hybrid sort of situations uh, because there'll be too many benefits of what we've learned. Um, mm. And I think also, uh, I think that really things won't go fully back into full gear until there's a vaccine. I think that I think that's just it. I think it's a case of, you know, we've still got the border closed between Canada and the US. Uh, because everyone's like, let's not rock this boat too much. Let's just sort of try to knock it down. So even if one country is able to eliminate it just by, you know, behavioral changes, um, if you start mixing people together, it's like, well, we're just back to where we were before, and now we have to lock it down again. So I think nothing will really go back to the way it was until we have a vaccine. Right. And uh, Liz uh, over here, she she wants to add, she's saying, Having a virtual event component means staff absolutely committed to providing the virtual experience. It has to be good quality, constant, consistent, and have uh, some form of interaction. And definitely, like, you know, in our events, we always try to keep things very interactive, even if it's a panel and so on. And, and you know, that, that experience still has to transcend, whether it's virtual or, you know, once we get in person. Diane says, just for last, is having a drive-in comedy event on July 25th. That's that's going to be interesting. I guess it's one of the, again, bigger co bigger companies, bigger budget companies that can do events to look at to like, how they're doing things and seeing if people are even enjoying Because, like, I had my first drive-in experience <laughs> in all my life. This is, like, full confession to going to the theaters. And... It's it's never the same as going to the cinema. It's a different experience, you know. But uh, it's never never the same. Um, but uh, yeah. And then uh, Heather says, um, "To me, I want to stay safe uh, for fear of infecting my parents." Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it, it comes back to it comes down to that too. You know, like even when we talk about the mask, is we're not wearing the mask to protect ourselves. We're, we're putting it because you know we don't want to infect someone else. And like you said, Stuart. You know that if that comes down to like oh like i haven't seen you for a while like, you know let's shake hands or give a hug maybe you know this time let's think of something else um yeah um a I lot think, of sorry, I just gonna, sorry go ahead amara no i was just gonna say a lot of events in the u.s people hit elbows that's been going on for right. years in, in big convention circuits um most notably to me at like penny arcade expo at pax throughout the u.s I think um, just to jump to it, back to Liz's point, what she was saying, it has to be good quality, constant, consistent, and have some more form of interaction for a virtual event. That's just totally right. I think that uh, one thing we tried to do this year, but because I'm an idiot and it's just me, um, we wanted to get uh, things like essentially take the convention swag and send it out before the convention starts. So that even though you weren't joining us here in Stratford, um, you had the t-shirt, you had the, the mugs, you had all the fun stuff you would collect anyway. And you can kind of feel like you're part of something. I know Mike Morrison in Calgary uh, did his uh, social media event. He had to cancel two in-person events and did one online event. And he's much more organized than I am. He's been doing it longer. And he uh, had all those swag packs sent out a week before so that, that they basically arrived the day of the event starting. So people were like, yeah, I'm part of this. I think that's an, an easy way to, to, as an event planner to make people feel like they're part of something, which is the key. Mm -hmm. And what was it, what was interesting about that is that I actually had a conversation about not only swag, but also food. If you were offering food and stuff, uh, there are some events that start partner, partnering up with local restaurants to sending out, you know, everyone gets the food at the same time and so on. I don't know how they organized that, but they, they made it happen. 
But the biggest constraint I had over there was, what do you do if you have an international audience? Now that you know you're doing things online, even I mean, I don't know, I don't know if you had an international audience for social media, nor now that now that it was online. But uh, you know, when you go online, you know, you can open doors to everyone. So how do you make sure that you know that experience is being you know translated the same way to everyone from around the world? You know, so that's not that's another challenge I feel as an organizer that you know we have now that we have for sure things online. Yeah. I think it requires decent planning and a lot of forethought. And I think that uh, I've been really impressed with how people have been doing online events this lockdown period, uh, because it's something that we, I think event people just didn't have to think about doing before. Um, so, you know, there's very, very, very few people who had done them before uh, as solely virtual online events. And I think that uh, you'll see that this carries on that the, the people like they got smart really fast and they did things really cool. And there's lots of amazing ideas. And uh, I think they'll just get better at doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Liz also talks about the justifying the price. If you're doing something online, then, you know, make it work well, you know, and that's why like, you know, doing things. Online, I mean, for us too, uh, doing things online have significantly reduced costs. I, I might say, because, you know, venue is one of the biggest portions and like you, you stored, you have, you talked about like how, you had to reduce your staff because most of the work, you know, was no longer needed at, at that point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, you know, things, but you know, you can also justify the price by saying, okay, you know, we're sending you this or we're doing this, or may maybe the things are being recorded and you're going to receive a package after, you know, there's like, what I find really, what I find is really funny about that though, is that, uh, you know, to pay to go to uh, uh, an in-person event, you're paying three, $400, $1,600, $2,000, Plus you're paying for your hotel, plus you're paying for your airfare, plus you're paying for transportation while you're there, plus you're paying for your food when you're not at the event. And then you do a virtual event, people are like, how dare you charge $200 for my ticket? And you're like, I've just saved you thousands of dollars. Why are you upset mm -hmm. at me? Uh, so I think there is a there is kind of a balance there and you have to have a perceived value as opposed to, I mean, we, did our, we didn't know what we were doing. So we kind of made our tickets really cheap. Um, they were 35 bucks and that got you a t-shirt and stuff. And 25 bucks just got you in the door for all the panels. That was for all of the panels for the entire week. And I think we could have charged $300 a ticket and it would have been just as worth it for people. I think there's that perceived value that uh, you have to make sure you maintain. And uh, I think people are now aware of like, well, yeah, this will be worth it. This is going to be worth my time to, to be part of this conversation. Yeah, again, I, I still feel I'm, I'm still baffled because of the whole because that you know like the the parks being pop overpopulated you know other other public places being overpopulated and you know we still don't have events but as as an event organizer um i don't feel comfortable doing an event anyways very very soon you know in person uh i still have my deposits for some of the events this year i never got them back and i don't even know if i'm gonna get them back but it's always the thing like I don't want to do even if they say okay do it like if it's say tomorrow we get an announcement from our premiere uh saying okay you can have an event now I don't feel comfortable of doing it right away, you know. I, th I think there's a lot of work to be done to getting ready for it, um, and we just talked talked about some of them, like sanitary sanitary reasons. Um, yeah. So, anyone wants to jump in and be part of the conversation? I also wanted to add that I've been thinking a lot about the challenges that exist with virtual events since this happened. I have, for the most part, I've had the same experience Stuart was talking about. I've gone to a lot of them that are really great and have been really well organized, but every once in a while, someone who's not used to being on live camera, that shows up and like something goes wrong and the other person disappears and they don't have like the theatrical background or the presentational background to be ready to tackle suddenly being in charge of something if their interviewer is gone or there isn't a video that they can play when something connections get lost or even default slides to go in the background. So I think those are all things that as event planners who are at least going to have a virtual component, we have to kind of think about in the future all the time. Like, do we have lots of backup content in case, you know, internet connections do what they do or, you know, people get, you know, they get disconnected somehow. So. I totally agree with Amara. I think that's absolutely right. I think one of the biggest aspects of doing anything virtually with virtual guests is you are handing off a huge portion of the production control to that person. Uh, one of my favorite things, most hilarious things ever was I emceed an online event a while ago, but maybe about coming up on two months ago now. And we did a tech rehearsal the night before. It's like, great, perfect. Let's do that to make sure we have all these guests ready to go and they're going to be well lit. We're going to be able to hear them, all that kind of stuff. 
And I wasn't in charge of it. I was just emceeing, but I showed up dutifully and I've got, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm literally on the set of our live stream right now. And I've got lights and you can hear me and it's fine and it's all good. And other people would join, they'd be like, well, it's kind of dark. Could you, uh, the floor directors, like, it's kind of dark. Could you maybe, you know, should we turn some lights on? They go, oh, oh, I won't be here for tomorrow's show. I'll be in a different room. You're like, what do you mean you're going to be in a different room? Like, this is, the idea is we're trying to sort of problem solve before we have to do it live. Um, so it is, you do have to be, uh, when you're producing an online event, there's way more considerations, I think, that you have to be aware of because you are handing off that, or not considerations, almost like fail safes, where you kind of have to be like, okay, in the event of this happening, someone's internet going down, them being way too dark, or I'm not being able to hear them, or whatever, I've got to be able to move quickly on to something else or, or to cover it up until we get fixed. I feel I've had more technical issues doing in-person events than <laughs> doing, no, it's true. I, I, mm -hmm. Last year, was it last year, two years ago, we had to do an event, uh, it was like around from around the world. We had an in-person event, but people were joining us from around the world. And we had so much technical issues because of the, in, I guess, the internet of the space. And it was working right before the event. When the event started, everything went, you know, down. On doing things online the past couple of months, I would say I, only once. I think Google Meets didn't want to work, and then we had to switch uh, to our Plan B, which was Zoom. Uh, but yeah, no, that was the only issue I had. Touch wood, but um, definitely having backup plans and so on. Uh, Liz actually is bringing up a very, very interesting point that actually t uh, touches me a lot because. Um, you know, again, uh, we talk about health and safety all the time and, uh, you know, I never want anything bad to happen to anyone who comes to our events, you know, because we feel responsible as an organizer, you know, whether you're giving them food or whatever, whatever it is, you're the one who's responsible for, for them. So Liz says, um, legally, I wonder what will, what would change for in, uh, in-person events? Uh, I know I've had uh, event insurance security and general codes of conduct. But what what are the liability waivers? Because you know, like if, you know, someone comes and we don't you know we don't predict it, but you know, someone gets COVID. What do you, like, I will feel guilty number one. But then what what will happen to you know the rest? You know, so that, I don't I don't know I don't know if insurance would even cover that. Yeah, I, I think you'd have to rely on waivers. I think you'd have to have a general indemnity basically as part of your terms and conditions that says you're entering at your own risk. I mean, it's kind of like going to Disneyland in California where they have signs up saying, you might get cancer going here today, but have a great day. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, you, you're you just gonna have to kind of blanket cover yourself and make sure that your guests are as safe as possible because never mind the legal responsibilities uh, from a business perspective, if something terrible happens, that's terrible for your business as well. And definitely a discussion to have with the venues, which are probably having the exact same kind of questions in the background. What are we going to do when things reopen? How are things going to re reopen? It's interesting. When I read Liz's uh, question, I, I thought she meant online, like for online events, not in-person ones. And I started thinking about like, I don't know if I can create waivers <laughs> for how precariously people stack their, you know, laptops. I don't know how that will work exactly. You know, you never know what's going on beyond <laughs> the scope of a screen in these uh, virtual spaces, which is, I guess, kind of part of the, the real life element of it, right? It, it's definitely, I think more in person and more, we're having more of a sense of in person through the fact that people really tend to bring them their whole self more when they have these virtual spaces. So some of the good, I'm a, a glass half full kind of gal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Diane talks about like having contingency plans for every possible glitch and Liz uh, wants to expand on, um, she's like, she says, I don't understand why the news media can't send a kit to some of the most frequent guests. Um, the quality <laughs> is so inconsistent. I think us uh, internet people have uh, much higher standards and it's true, you know, we, we've I, been doing our, you know, we've been using our, our, our knowledge and skills in technology and. Some, yeah, I was spoiled YouTube. doing Social Media North as well because it was like the people who were on the panels were all tech people, they're all social media people. So they kind of got, we got it. They sort of were able to solve their own problems. But yeah, for sure, there's a great Twitter account, which is a rate my Skype room. And uh, and it just rates the setup that people have and it's hilarious and fantastic. But it's just like, there's a lot of, you know, people like this who are talking and you know, like, yeah, how's this, is this good for my interview? No, um, or like this is also another favorite. Um, but I think people get better at it as they go as well. And the learning, like I'm just really impressed with people, like how quickly people have just adjusted to doing video chats on in general. Um, 
uh, my mother does them. I, I, my mother filmed a whole bunch of stuff by herself because I can't go visit her because of uh, the lockdown. And, uh, you know, she's just filming her own stuff. And I'm like, wow, this is really impressive. This is really great. It's a great opportunity for people who are willing to have the flexibility. I really actually liked your term of forced opportunity, but people who are willing to have the flexibility to try things like sure. as, as someone who also wears the hat of creator in general, this is a kind of lucky time for us to get to be able to be venturing into the unknown, which is one of the things that creators across platform have always been really good at trying out new tech leading the way with what it can do, pushing the kind of boundaries for what that can be. So combining that flexibility and that like creativity mm -hmm. in how events go forward means we may get more global, more interactive, more um, complex and value adding events going forward, which I think is, uh, you know, again, a great silver lining to a situation that none of us could have imagined before this. Absolutely. I think that's a, a, one of the biggest of any benefit that could come from what's happened with the pandemic that's that's kind of it and it's kind of almost instilled this kind of punk rock ethos into people of like well let's just try let's just see what let's see we'll try this uh and just as, as a side sort of example of that in our small town on the main street uh there's uh, four lanes of traffic and then there's parking on the outside of those as well on the perimeter of those as well and to the restaurants we can't have anyone inside the restaurants here um, but they can do patios so uh, they've extended out into the parking areas these sidewalks that are like wooden boardwalks now that go down the main street. So there's like umbrellas and people sitting out and it's beautiful. And it's that's something we would have never done. We're a tourist town. We would have never have rocked the boat to try that had we not been forced to be able to try that. Um, so it's great. And I hope that there's lots of things like that that happen. I think there will be. Of uh, people going, well, I'm going to try this and sort of we'll mess around with this, as you said, this kind of tech or whatever, because you, you're not rocking your boat. The boat's already sunk. So let's just try something new. Let's try something different. Well, since since we're still online uh, now, because we cannot foresee when you know we're going to be able to do in-person events and so on, have you found any like any great software in terms of like uh, event experiences online? Because I, I, I kept looking right before I started doing online events. I found a few, but they were all beta. They they couldn't like they they weren't all you know released yet. Not for me. No, I mean I um I was pretty green at the whole thing. So I was doing uh, just Eventbrite and Zoom because I figured everyone would know how to use Zoom, and uh, kept it as and Zapier. Sorry to sort of integrate the two of them together. Um, but apart from that, I haven't. I think I might investigate some other some other solutions later. Even just things like Zoom, I think is was amazing platform, but I think it was also uh, it's it's not as smooth as it could be still. Yeah, for me, it's mainly been uh, smaller things, but having to do with either Zoom calls, Google Hangouts, or um, Microsoft Teams is actually being used by a lot of like medical professionals mm -hmm. and also for um, a lot of academics. I was out there actually speaking, speaking of parents, I was speaking with my mother about what her university is using and they're doing a lot of calls um, on Microsoft Teams, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, you know, like, like again, everyone, you know, switched to online and yet, and yet we still have a, you know, I guess like you're you're just talking about that story. I just watched your video too, and I'm I'm still always like so baffled of seeing, like, because you talked about how in your town people cannot go indoors. You know, everyone's on the patio, and like here, everyone's going indoors and still having you know their their, their time. And I'm like, how how is this happening? You know, and like like I I just I just can't get my head around around all that. And it's like I would never be able to do like. Again, even even if they said, "Come, you know, I'll, I'll rent you my my club or my bar, do an event," and I'll be like, even even if it's outside, even if it's in the park, I'll be like, I don't know if I want to risk being bringing people together and then being the one who's responsible of getting them whatever they catch, you know. So, totally um, agree. Totally yeah. agree. Yeah, I think that that idea, like every time you see a, a gathering of a bunch of people now, um, you sort of go, "Well, we'll wait fourteen days and see how it really went." Uh, I mean, even when we were in Playlist uh, at the beginning of March, um, we left on March the 1st. We were aware of COVID, but there wasn't any sort of great panic about it. We knew that at the time there were zero cases confirmed of COVID in Florida. But then we got back and within a week, I was like, oh my God, how did, how did like, I kept searching the news for like, how did nobody at Playlist get COVID? Like, that's crazy. 
if anyone could catch anything, I mean, there's always the playlist cold or the VidCon flu or something, right? And it's like, if anyone could catch anything, you go catch it there. And uh, I'm amazed it didn't happen. I don't think I could do it as an event planner. That's one stress I just don't want to add to the pile. Right. Yes, social media marketing world was right before this insight. This happened also, and enough so that there was a day where people were wondering if they needed to leave early. Like it, it was just we were starting to see it be less a rumor of something was happening and more a reality of something was happening. Um, and you know, I, I definitely, I, I can't imagine what that's like as an event planner either. Thinking about what's the aftermath going to be of this? How is how is the like the press going to be about this event after this? Like, and slash, are people going to be okay? Um, mm -hmm. But luckily, that was I, to the best of my knowledge, everything's been fine there too. Yeah. Again, like going back to the waiver thing, I think it's just you know it's you want to make sure that people are safe and healthy at what you're doing. And then from a totally disconnected view, again, you, if someone gets hurt or someone becomes unhealthy because of being at your event, that's shot you for the next year. You're done for. You can't, it's hard to get past that. Mm -hmm. um, so even like on, you know, beyond the sort of, you know, benevolent sort of looking out for each other and, and making sure people are happy and healthy, um, just that notion of the, the potential business damage is terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Liz, Liz is talking about b people being decent human beings, and you know, I, I've organized events with Liz when we all started this community, and you know, already, already, we know it was a risk, you know, bringing people in because we don't know who's coming in, you know, we don't know what what history they have, you don't know, you know, what they're gonna do at the event, and thankfully, you know, we had a close knit, you know, community, so you know, things remain safe, and if there was any bad weeds or anything, you know, like, you know, we we, we took the measures for it, uh, but you know. You know whether it's now it's COVID or anything else. Uh, it's always thinking about like, okay, if this happens, what do we do? If this happens, what do we do? Because we want to make sure you know the health and safety. Is not not just for COVID, but literally for everything, has to be applied, and more than ever now. Uh, but yeah, yeah, all those skills for fostering a community, live or online, become so critical when it comes to something like this, because you can't, you, by no means can you control everyone in the community and you don't always know who everyone in the community is when they're scaled to a certain size. Um, so I definitely think that you have to kind of think about security issues, protocols, how you're going to convey messages that people may not want to hear. Um, I don't know if this is as much of an issue where you all are, but definitely there's a, a difference in political leanings <laughs> feelings regarding this where I am that I know is greatly publicized everywhere. Um, and so those conflicts, how, how to get through those conflicts of dealing with people or explaining a perspective. I've started talking to a lot of people in my life who maybe have different perspectives on this about how like mask wearing is also a kindness, right? It's also says to people, I care about you. So maybe if you can't, for some reason, <laughs> understand why it needs to happen for for medical reasons to think about those pieces and having that kind of compassionate discussion with people about how events are only good if people bring goodness to them um just like how these kinds of conversations are only valuable if people like bring value and are really honest with things um so it's kind of a new take on a modern professionalism maybe mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, to end, to end it off, it's, it's definitely that it's like, how do you, how do you even like say, excuse me, but you're not, you're, you know, we made masks mandatory at our event, you're not wearing one, I will have to ask you to leave, you know, it's like, right. like it's already tough, you know, talking to someone and like, you know, they can, you know, completely blow, uh, you know, blow up in front of you, and you know, the yeah. way they, they will express themselves and you're like, no, no, you have to like, don't make a scene, you know, please leave. And, and people bring high emotion to events, things that they pay to go to, things that they <clears> wait <throat> to go to. Um, I often think about how like conventions and events are often that one day a year or that one weekend a year that somebody gets to do this thing that they love. So sometimes they'll like bottle up all of their like, you know, intensity towards their passion for that thing, and it all lands on the doorstep. So a small <laughs> conflict can quickly become a huge conflict. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about na navigating those waters and the skills that people need to be thinking about maybe building if they want to be in the event space with what's coming, with the changes that are coming. I think it really uh, comes down to communication as well, which is this always challenging. I find it very challenging all the time. Uh, you know, in my experience, I've, I've been self-employed since I was 19, 
Um, but just learning how to market things to people and how to say things to people. Um, you know, I, when we, we ran a tech company in the late 90s, in the 2000s, and uh, I would always say to the staff, like, never underestimate the stupidity of the masses. And it's not meaning that they're stupid, but it means that there's so much other stuff happening and being they're being bombarded by messaging and what to do, what not to do, and their kids are screaming at them and their boss is screaming at them. So how do you cut through that? And you really do have to uh, make the communication as clear as possible. Uh, I'm doing work with a company uh, currently, and the one of the heads of the company is the nicest possible person. So lovely, very, very sweet, uh, but a horrendous communicator and will send me these like emails full of messages where I'm like, there are three points in this. Give me those three points. I don't need all the other stuff around it because I will miss those three points if I don't, I can't always stop to dig through it. So I think for event uh, planning in the future, you're going to have to make sure that uh, that communication and, and, and things like with the masks and hand sanitizing and all that kind of stuff, uh, you kind of have to be like hit people over the head. And when you think, oh man, I've really, you know, I've overdone it on this. I've been flogging a dead horse. Do it 10 times more because there's people who are like, oh, I didn't know this. Um, and I think that's just, you know, made even more exaggerated by the fact, by the age we're living in with social media and everyone's got their phone and they're constantly being bombarded directly by different people. So communication, I think, is, is going to be even more important than ever before. So to, to leave on a, on a last note, talking about everything that's sanitary, like hand sanitizers, masks and so on. For say, there, you know, the vaccine comes out, you know, and, and people have been vaccinated and the risk have dropped of getting COVID, would us as event organizers, but in general, you know, for events, do uh, like all these things, will, will, do you think it will remain? You know, will it, will, it be, will it be part of events even in the future after after the pandemic? I think so. I think a, a lot, not all of it, but I think a lot of it will. I was saying to my wife last week, I said, I think, you know, once we get through this, with COVID, I think it's going to be much more commonplace to see someone wearing a mask, like when you go up and around. I think when you know, you look at sort of you know uh, in, in Japan or China, and you see people out they're wearing masks um, for different reasons sometimes. But I, it sort of looked foreign, whereas that now it kind of looks oh well, yeah, I guess I get you know if I did have a, a the flu or something and I had to go do something, I'd probably just put a mask on. And I wouldn't feel like people are going to be saying, you know, why is this guy wearing a mask? They'd be just like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, so I think some of those things will will carry through for sure. And of course, like the virtual part of, of planning, I think there's too many benefits in doing this. Like I'm able to, you know, like Amara is in Seattle and I'm in Stratford and you're in Montreal. And I mean, this is, you couldn't justify us getting together for 45 minutes otherwise. Right. Whereas we provided this value and this sort of cool conversation um, from very different perspectives, like geographically and, you know, whatever. So it's, 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 it'll definitely be part of it. Yeah, I think so too. I think there's um, a lot of attitude shift that's come with this. I keep thinking about that a lot. Like what does after look like? Like who, who, how we behave, how we feel about the world, how we feel about community. Um, but I think that uh, there's a lot of really positive things too. I think people really have noticed how much they value the interaction of being around people and people really are thinking about those things. I've seen, while I've seen some things that were not courteous, I've seen a lot of people go out of their way to try and be kind. I hope that's kind of a thing that flows into event spaces. Um, so I definitely think that there's going to be a lot of these elements i really do think we're going to see like masks as swag coming up in the next more hand sanitizer all those companies that make those kinds of pieces of things are probably making big lists about like health and health and safety things they can sell for the future um and i do think that also like the the different forms of how people stay healthy in different parts of the world so things like masks in um often in japan is where i've seen it most in my life um I think those things will also move across as we have a more like global event space. So I think that's kind of cool and interesting and a little bit of a uh, positive culture change too. Again, something that's kind of hard. So very hard. Yeah. Very well said, very well said. Well, this is definitely a conversation to keep having as things keep evolving almost at a daily basis now. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I, I welcome everyone to, you know, even have these conversations around you with, with, with the people around you. And if you're an event planner or in the event industry, definitely something to, 
you know, talk as, as a group to finding solutions and making sure that the experience is, is going well, but at the same time, health and safety is part of the experience. So thinking about that. But thank you, thank you so much again for uh, being part of this panel. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Amara. Thank you, everyone else who, who joined as well. Also, you know, leaving the beautiful comments and questions and, you know, your way of participating uh, on, on the chat. I hope this helped. Um, you know, again, like I said, have keep on having these conversations and uh, we can't wait to see you all in person, but, you know, let's, you know, make sure that everyone's uh, uh, ready and safe first. And uh, once that happens, then, uh, you know, we'll be there. But for now, we can always, you know, we talked about hugs and stuff. We can actually give all a virtual hug because we can't, we can't be there in person. So <laughs> we'll do that. It's the closest thing we can do uh, to uh, show our kindness and appreciation. So thank you again. And uh, we hope to see you all soon.